Hey, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Uh, today is April the 9th, 2017, and we're going to talk about movies, horror movies today, and some other stuff. So uh, let's do let's do prizes. Matt's got a prize, and I've got a prize. Um, I don't know how many of the newer viewers out there remember John Glasby, um, old-time English mythos writer. Um, his uh, short stories were assembled into a collection uh, by uh, Wildside Press. Um, there's uh, what, seven story, uh, six stories in here. Uh, that's a slim the lonely shadow. The lonely shadows. The lonely shadows. So it's a nice little collection for someone who's a mythos fiend. All right, very, and very Dolethian writer. Very much. Well, I think those stories were originally supposed to be published by Derelith. Well, he, he's the, it's, it's, that collection mixes the ones he originally wrote for Derelith with the later ones he wrote for Bob Price. There you go. Uh, and I've got another Necronomicon ticket to give away, courtesy of Niels Hobbs and the people at Necronomicon. Um, so if you're watching the show or listening to the show anytime this week, in between now and next Sunday, again, today is April the 9th, 2017 you know if you're if a lot of people listen to the podcast later in the week so you, you can get in on this um prize yes pete next sunday what? is easter yeah i know that so you, but i'm a heathen i know that but you should think about whether or not you're going to have a show i'm gonna have a show jeffrey thomas is going to be here okay great yeah because most people listen later in the week i mean we get it quite a live but most people listen later in the week so uh, I mean, you'll probably be in church is, knowing you, Pete, but I won't be. Jeff is a heathen, too, as is the rest of the panel. Just call me Endeavor. But the thing is, I'll have family stuff going on, I'm sure. Yeah, could be. Um, but like I said, they can listen later in the week. Yep. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, also, if you give to my Patreon, you're also automatically entered into these prizes. So if you're not a Patreon pledger, use a uh, donator, I hope you'll consider it. Um, if I reach my first goal, we'll create a fiction podcast, Lovecraftian fiction podcast. And uh, I might even get to pay some bills in the meantime. Yeah, Pete. So I can, I can offer this as a giveaway. It's a brand new copy of The Fungal Stain by uh, William Pugmire. Oh, okay. But I suggest that you only give this away to Patreon members. Okay, we can do that. So, um, I'll have the link in the not if you're watching live, but if you're watching later on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast, I'll have the Patreon link about section. So, okay, let's uh, let's do prizes. Um, now we did prizes. Let's do intros with uh, Rick and work our way over. I am Rick Lay, writer. Pete? Uh, Pete Rollick, uh, professional mad scientist. <laughs> I'm Matt Carpenter, an alleged editor. Ruh -ruh. Kelly? I'm Kelly Young. I am actually three ducks in a human suit. I've not heard that one before. <laughs> you Actually, me, right? I, I have. I have. All right, I thought Joe. it was three eels in a human suit. But... I'm, Joe. I'm Joe Polver. I'm a construct that was aborted due to technical issues. <laughs> All right, we're doing it this way today. I, I'm Mike Davis, and I'm the guy that the rest of these guys have to put up with since it's I'm the host of the show, so... They have no choice. They can't kick me out. No matter no matter how many times I screw up, they have to keep me out. So, um, yes. No, I'm not saying nothing. No. Well, I spent three hours this week in a meeting that should have been a two-page memo. I'm, I'm, I'm apparently not as smart as some other people. And they'll they don't mind telling you that either, do they? That's right. Or making you feel that way. 
That's uh, correct. Let's talk about Kelly Young's package because there's been an interesting development. <laughs> I don't want to talk about his package. Uh, <laughs> Look, I spent a night with Kelly. All right. And we were both drunk. <laughs> the movie. The, the oh, uh, film. There's, the there's film. the question everyone wanted answered. Will the package be unwrapped? <laughs> It's, no, it's been on, the package it, was not well, unwrapped. Kelly, it, has, it has been unwrapped of a sort. Kelly can make the announcement. Well, yeah, wait we, a minute. Uh, oh. Pete, Pete, I'm sorry. Pete says the package can't be unwrapped. Why do you, after spending the night with Kelly, Pete, do you have exclusivity? Well, I've seen Kelly Young's package, and I know what happens. It's, it's, not, a, it's a good film, yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Kelly. Oh, this has become so uncomfortable. Um, we, uh, well, so I have a short film called The Package that has been doing the festival circuit. And we played our last festival last night, the Bone Bat Comedy of Terrors Film Festival in Seattle, where it got a, uh, a great response. And, and this is a look, let me butt in, this is a look, Lovecraftian short film. It is yes. perhaps the most Lovecraftian, yes. anti-Lovecraftian film I've ever seen. It's, it's great. Yeah, and on. it is it is now available on YouTube um, for a limited time because it is going on to the uh, 2016 Best of HP Lovecraft Film Festival DVD. And once that happens, it will no longer be available on YouTube. But it is on YouTube right now. Um, I'm not sure how you would search it, to be honest. But, Mike, you said you were going to throw it up on the easy Yeah, page I'll that... throw it up on the uh, Lovecraft Easy and Facebook page tomorrow. And if anyone wants to watch it tonight, you can't wait till tomorrow. I guess the quickest way would be to go to Facebook and and go to Strange Eons uh, Facebook page A E O N S because that's their top uh, topmost post right now. And there's a link to the YouTube video right there. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, it is on the Strange Eons magazine Facebook page. So yeah. So, but I, I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna link to the file tomorrow. So thank the, you. It, it it really all kidding aside, it's a very nice film. So <laughs> thank you. It, it was fun. Two minutes it. well worth your time <laughs> watching this. Definitely worth Just your like time. Just like Kelly Young. That's right. <laughs> uh, our new slogan, yeah. Well worth your time. And occasionally informative. Two minutes right, and it so, ends with a laugh. All right. Question, Kelly. Was I pushy enough with the Patreon this week? Because you thought I wasn't it didn't go yeah. to used car salesman last week. <laughs> I thought that it could have bore a little mention last week other than I'm starting a Patreon, and uh, I hope you'll be interested in it, and see you later. <laughs> uh, last thing about the Patreon is that, hey, you know what? Five bucks, that's one McDonald's meal or Burger King or wherever the hell you go for fast food, and that's one t time a month. So it would really help me out and help the, the easing out. So. All right, so commercial is over. Let's move on to the fun stuff. Um, horror movies. Let's talk about horror movies. Yes. Let's talk about horror movies. I have a list. All right. I think we all have lists. Let's start. We don't have to go down Kelly's list first, but let's start with The Void because that's on everybody's mind right now, and I know that Kelly has seen The Void. Yeah, did anybody else happen to check this out? It's coming on Amazon, not Amazon, Netflix next month. Oh, it is. Already? Okay, it, it, it is yeah. on Amazon and iTunes right now. Yeah, it is. It's in theaters, but you can catch it on Amazon streaming. It's, got a, very, it's got a very limited distribution of theaters. Like it's like I live in Long Island, and it's all in New York, and it's only in Brooklyn. Well, I think that's a great solution. If it's got a limited uh, theater release, then putting it on home video at the same time is is a good solution. Yeah. You know, Yeah. so... Any, anyways, no, no spoilers, obviously, but is this worth watching? Should we watch this movie, Kelly? Uh, if the question is, is this worth watching, it is worth watching, absolutely. I didn't love it, uh, but I did like it quite a bit. And um, it felt very much like, um, well, it felt very much like Prince of Darkness to me, uh, John Carpenter's film. And it managed to avoid the problem I have with Prince of Darkness, which is that halfway through it turns into a slasher film 
and I, I always thought that was kind of the the wrong way to go with that movie. This one does not do that, and it is uh, it is very Lovecraftian, no doubt about it. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. So, it, all right. So, what, you're comfortable calling it a Lovecraftian film? Yeah, it's uh, it is cosmic horror all the way. Okay. Well, what kind of besides Lovecraftian? What kind of horror movie would you classify it as? Um, I think you mentioned body horror, and it's very – is it very gory? It's pretty gory. It's or pretty not. gory, and okay. it, it is body horror. It's uh, It's got um, – the big sell for it is practical effects, and the practical effects are pretty damn good. Um, it feels – in look and in sound design, especially the music, like a John Carpenter film. Uh, and maybe um, the body horror is reminiscent of uh, Cronenberg's stuff when, when he was dabbling in that. I guess he's always dabbling in that, but The Fly and Existence, those kind of things. It feels very much like that kind of film. It's got, uh, it's got a leg in the middle, at least I thought it did, but I wasn't disappointed you know at the end of the film I, I thought it was pretty dang good especially for a, a low budget film I had those guys on here two years ago right at two years ago um, when they were still I guess they were still filming at the time or maybe they were just wrapping up I don't know well, what's the history of this was this a Kickstarter film or how did they I, I was thinking I, I, right before the show I thought I should have reviewed my notes because I do not remember that so but they were great to talk to i remember that so. well there's the love is all there on the screen you can tell that these guys are fans i rem i remember that from them as well yeah all right so uh i guess i have to watch it since it's a lovecraftian film i'm not into body horror really but and from the reactions i've seen like on the lovecraft easy facebook page i think joe nailed it just that percentage just about right before the show looks like about, I don't know, 20 to 30% of people don't like it. And 70% of the people do like it. So it's one of those ones that's been so ridiculously hyped up that it's very difficult to live up to that kind of stuff. Uh, Benjamin Handelman says on the, uh, on the YouTube chat, uh, live chat, he says they credit Kickstarter supporters in the credits. So that answers your question. Kelly. Perfect. Yeah. Good old Kickstarter. A lot of projects wouldn't exist without it. Yeah. All right. Who wants to start with, with the list first? Pete, you look like you're raring to go. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> actually, and so, yeah, this is – so my all-time favorite film of all time isn't a horror movie, but it's a suspense film. It's, it's Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Mm. Um. But that leads me to what I do think of as a as a psychological horror movie, and that's Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Vertigo is just an incredible exercise in psychological torture in two directions. You've yeah. got – go ahead. I just had a really, really cool experience years ago. Isabel had a conference to go to in San Francisco, and I went you know, just to hang around. We went to the old Castro Theater, which is one of those old 1,500-seat Hollywood-type theaters with the crushed velvet seats and velvet ropes. and um, it, it was beautiful, and they played Vertigo, the restored version, uh, limited release to these grand old cinemas. It was shot in San Francisco, so we spent the next day going around to some places where they had scenes shot from Vertigo. Uh, including the Sequoia Forest. It was very nice. Cool. That must have been fun. Soft spot for that movie. Um, more traditional horror films. Uh, the, the original version of Shudder, the Thai 2000 inversion, uh, is an incredible ghost story. Uh, so is the Singapore version of The Eye. Um, audition. Ringu. No, no, Audition, no. <laughs> you didn't like Audition, did you? I I was in Borders once, and I had a couple of gift certificates 
and they were marking stuff down. And there was a copy of Audition I could have bought for two ninety nine, so for free. And I read what it said and went, "There ain't no way in the world I'm gonna watch <laughs> ever." I haven't seen it. What's 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 it about? Audition is about a lonely film producer, uh, television show producer who uses his his job to find new love. Oh, it's a romance, and it yeah. doesn't go well. It, and, it almost and, is a uh, romantic comedy type setup. It, it is. just goes horribly awry. It goes horribly wrong. <laughs> Uh, looking for love in all, all the wrong places. Uh, <laughs> Ringu, um, a little thing that's not seen too much carved um, about the slip-faced, slip-mouthed woman legend in Japan. You uh, like Japanese horror, in other words. Uh, no, I, I, I like some Japanese horror. Okay. That happens to be what I focused on for the beginning. Uh, Train to Busan I really enjoyed. Um, I haven't seen that that's yet. Korean. That's, that's it's on, Korean. And it's on Netflix now, I think. It is. It is. And yeah. then the Korean film, The Host, I thought was really well done. Um, British horror, Island. Wait a minute. Train to Busan. That is, is that a zombie, zombie film? Because I don't like zombie it's films. Zombie but everyone movie. says, even if you don't like zombie movies, you should watch it. Well, I think that, that what separates Train from Busan is actually some decent acting and some decent decisions on the part of various characters. Um, you know, we always have that, that, that why are you doing it? That's the stupidest thing you could do. And here are some of those conversations that are actually held in the oh. Okay. And some rational and some irrational decisions are made, but for both gr groups, it seems like a logical choice. Um, All right. For British Island of Terror, Horror Express, The Creeping Flesh. Oh, yeah, Horror Express. I'm not keeping up, buddy. <laughs> X, the are you writing these down, Matt? <laughs> I'm trying to put links up to the web page. Oh, you don't have to do that. It's not a big deal. Yeah. X the Unknown and the Wicker Man. The Wicker Man was brilliant. I thought it was a little crafty. Yeah, and, Wicker Man, definitely. Uh, both Village of the Damned and Children of the Damned, the originals, not the remakes. Mm hmm. Um, American stuff that I like uh, Night of the Creeps and the unofficial, not intentional sequel, Slither. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Kelly? I, I I love both those films. Uh, James Gunn will come right out and say that he I don't think he even saw Night of the Creeps. Right, and, and it's unintentional, but damn, they work together so well. Yeah. Um, Phantasm for '80s horror. Phantasm scared the crap out of me. Well, and, I don't know if I just watched it as an adult, but I just I couldn't get into it, and if that was the reason why. But. You know, as as a kid, as a teen, watching Phantasm just really – this is what you could do with no money. You could yeah. actually make a scary friggin' film with no money. Um, uh, 1950s, 60s, The Blob with, what, Steve McQueen? Both The Fly and Return of the Fly, but not Son of the Blob. Can you, can, you, can you go back to the blob? Yes. Because the ending was so poor. The Let's drop it in the Antarctic. And, or right. the Arctic. So like, does they show like a box falling out of the sky into the middle of somewhere. I mean, yeah. And then a giant question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Come on. It's yes. Like, it but, so um, I'd rather watch Kaltiki. Well, there you go. Um, I like I like the the side note to the blob that you know Joseph Payne Brennan apparently got a settlement out of it. So, um, both the Fly and Return of the Fly, the originals, not the remakes. Um, for more modern stuff, Grabbers, which I think is a great horror comedy. I liked Grabbers quite a bit actually. And and, and I think Tremors. Yeah. You know, Grabbers and Tremors are both in the. They're two peas in a pod. Yep. Um, 
just for complete gore fest, Roger Corman's Galaxy of Terror and both versions of Humanoids from the Deep. I just I love those films. They're they're bad, but they're worth watching. Um, John Carpenter's uh, quadrilogy: The Fog, The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and In the Mouth of Madness. Oh yeah, The Fog. Uh, you know, I I keep I dismiss The Fog because it's not a creature fest, but then I go back and I watch it. And I'm like, damn, this is paced really damn well, and the music is perfect. Wait. Music by John Carpenter. Right, right. Um, yeah, you know the opening of the fog. I've always just loved that um, that piano music that yeah. is there right at the beginning, and then the Edgar Allan Poe quote. Yep, it's just beautifully done. And then you go from there to the uh, what's that old actor's name that was reading the story on the beach? Oh, oh uh, God, a guy from Paper Chase. Houseman. Houseman. Yeah. 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 Hausman, yeah. Uh, I just want to tell Pete something. Yeah. All right. You you criticized me for having you watch The Blind Dead. Yes. I think the movie was the ship in the fog and The Blind Dead influenced the fog. Interesting. Interesting. That's an interesting idea. That'd be fun to go back and do the research on. Yeah. Um. All right. So yeah. So there's the John Carpenter's. Look, you can't have this list and not say Jaws. You can't. Um, you know what makes Jaws such an effective film that the they couldn't get the Jaws to work. Yeah. So he doesn't appear for what the first half. I haven't seen it in years. Right. Which makes yeah. it such a great suspense movie. Um, Same thing with Alien. When when you're forced to not be able to show the creature, then you come up with interesting ways to build that suspense. Correct. Uh, three Stephen King films. That all have something in common: Cujo, Pet Cemetery, and The Mist. And they all have horrific things to do with children. Yeah, I've got a couple Stephen King movies on my list, and none of those are are it. Yeah, but you know, I have. I guess I have as an adult, as a father, I have a problem when kids are monsters, and or victims. Kids are always monsters. Yeah, well, yes. You know that they're doing a okay. a mist remake for TV. I, I believe. Yes. Yep. Uh, Mini series. Yeah. Mini series. Yes. And then I'm going to talk about two films really quickly. Well, three. There's the Midnight Meat Train, inspired by a Clive Barker story. Yeah, and by the way, folks, that is newly on Netflix, and that yeah. is, I, in my personal opinion, quite Lovecraftian. Yes, I would agree. Yes. Borrows from Pickman's yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. Pickman's model and Four Below by Robert Balfour Johnson. So the influence is on Yep. Um, I think Clive Barker's Hellraiser is a masterpiece. And as I've grown up, I used to love Nightbreed, and I recently watched it, and I was like, "Oh, Nightbreed's not so good," and. What Nightbreed is, is a beautiful monster fest. And if you ignore the storyline and some of the acting, it's just beautiful art, you know, practical effects um, that I think work really well. The rest of it, mm, not so much. And there's an on-the-nose lesson there somewhere in the movie. Yes. Humans are Very. the real monsters. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are the movies that I put together as my my go to films. Um, All right. Uh, I think Joe wanted to go next. Well, only because uh, my list is going to be boring, boring, and you said horror. So yeah, but horror I mean, can be with, horror can be like suspenseful, scary. It could be slasher. I, I, you know, like, there's a lot of me, that, cover a lot. Yeah, to me, that's to me, that's true, but I try to stay more with horror. Horror. I I agree with Pete completely about Vertigo, which happens to be my favorite Hitchcock film. Um, yeah, you know, it, just to, to interrupt you just for a second, you know, Vertigo works really well as a suspense movie, but then 
if you look at it as, as sort of like this psychological torture film in which Novak tortures Stewart and then mm-hmm. Stewart slowly tortures Novak. Yeah. All right. Does someone have a dog or is something in the in the microphones? Yeah, my just dog squeaking is barking. occasionally. Okay. Uh, that's not a metaphor, right? You're, it's your dog. Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> okay. Well, my my first one is Alien. I just think it oh, yeah. it works on every level. Um, well, that's not boring. Well, it's but it's common. Um, yeah. Okay. My my second one is is the original Frankenstein. I was a little kid when I saw it. The idea that you could take parts of dead people and make something out of them was beyond terrifying. And if, if I mention Frankenstein, then I have to mention the Bride of Frankenstein, which I think... Go, go back to Frankenstein a second. Because yeah. When it came out and it was on TV when I was a little kid, they actually censored it. The scene by the mill pond. Initially. Right. The, gr- the girl being tossed in, right. Because that was actually one of the most terrifying scenes in cinema. It still is incredibly effective. Oh, it is. But, 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 but that was originally censored by the director. There was a scene cut from that that's now restored. Right. So I'm not uh, sure if you saw if you saw the original version. The well, what what I saw was the version that was playing on TV. And I'm talking scene. about what what Matt saw. Oh, it, I saw it in the theater. Um, I've said before, one of my great memories is when my dad took me and my two older brothers to a monster film festival, and we saw like Wolfman, Dracula, and Frankenstein in the cinema around Halloween when I was a little kid. So it's whatever was playing in the cinema at that time. In in the uh, in the original cut version that the studio put out, the mo- the girl says the, the, they're throwing the flowers and the, mo- the monster doesn't have any flowers and he reaches for her and then there's a cut. Right. And then in the restored version, you see him lift her up and throw her in the water. Mm-hmm. Um. And you know, there is that truism in the US, it's hard to get approval for horror movies that involve children. Do you know what I mean? In the United States, it is, yeah. Yeah, and and this may, I wonder what would have happened if they had just let this go, if it would have opened up a different path to horror. But, But to this day, we have, I mean, when Nightmare's Disciple originally came out, Chaosium wanted to, on the title page and on the back cover, have a disclaimer because of the scene where the girl is beaten to death. Uh, I mean, they were terrified by the scene. They never talked about cutting it, but they wanted to paste the disclaimer in, in two places of the book. Um, what, that a horror book might be violent? Against the child, that was their, and it's like, this is a child, pre- this guy preys on children as well as adults, it, you know. Yeah, that, that, that said so in the synopsis of the book, didn't it? Yeah, it, the other thing too is, the, the scene is written really, sh- there's a long setup, then he actually grabs the girl, and he's got a hammer, you know, and it says something to the, I don't know what it says, the hammer came down, whatever. But we don't get into him beating on her with the hammer, just here's the long setup, here's the girl, he drags her into the van, he has a hammer, we know he kills her. Well, he could have benefited um, from therapy. I got that out of it. Yeah, but, you know, they were beyond t- mortified. Mm. So, Interesting. I mean, that's still, and let's face it, we're, we're all reasonable. Violence against children just incenses us to the nth degree, period, which it should. Um, so, um, but yeah, Frank Frankenstein and, of course, Bride of Frankenstein, 
And while I'm on a Frankenstein jag, you got to include Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, um, which Rick has mentioned here before, and, and I have as well. I'm um, sensing a theme so far. Well, it just just Frankenstein is so important to me, and I can't mention Frankenstein without The Bride, which is a much better film. And Abbott and Costello is also a wonderful film. Um, and it's one of the few instances where, where humor and horror can coexist to me. I mean, normally I have not much use for that. Um, yeah, I would, personally, I would agree most of the time. And it's why when it's done well, I like it so much. Like uh, Pete mentioned, Grabbers and Trimmers. I think it's done very well in those two movies. But normally oh, when, I'm not a fan of it. When, it. when it's done well and it pops, it's heavenly. But yeah. if, if you can't make it sing properly, get me to hell out of there, you know? Um, so, yeah. Uh, my next one is The Innocence that starred Deborah Kerr. Um, I don't know when that was, early 60s? Rick will probably know. Yeah, it's early 60s or late um, 50s. Around 1960s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I adore Carnival of Souls. Um, the film bothers me. It just, I, I think it's an amazingly creepy film. Um, uh, I love The Exorcist. And I love The Exorcist, the third one. The repartee between um, George C. Scott and the priest. I adore, I think Brad Dorff was wonderful. Um, the nurse that crosses the hall with the surgical shears, if whatever they're called, I don't know. That, that little second or two bothers me deeply. It always has. Um, um, the Exorcist, I would be interested in, in hearing from the live audience in the, in the chat if they like The Exorcist. I have tried to, of course, I didn't watch it as a kid uh, and tried to watch it as an adult, and it seemed kind of slow to me. Maybe I wasn't in the right mindset because I've definitely watched slow horror movies that I like, or <laughs> slow, well, that, it's not slow in a bad sense, but you know what I mean, it doesn't. I, th it, I think it was a shared emotional experience because my yeah. thing about The Exorcist is I was maybe 14, and a friend and I wanted to sneak in and watch it because it's getting such press. And what I remember is we had to take a bus. Like this is like, you know, God knows it was ages ago. We had to take a bus like miles away from home, and then the theater was the miles away too. from the bus stop. And so when we finally get there, it's like the show's going to start in like 15 minutes. So you have to run <coughs> from the bus stop to the theater, and we get there. Of course, we're underage, and the, 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 the guy, my friend had said, you know, they always let you into this theater. We got there. The theater manager was standing right behind the ticket taker, and we asked for tickets. He said, how old are you? And that was that. I didn't mm -hmm. get to see it till I was in college, and they showed it at the college theater. And I had to say, I was not moved by it. It was no longer a shared experience. Yeah, I, I, I saw it when it came out in the theaters, loved it to death, scared the bejesus out of me. Um, I think you're right about the shared experience aspect of that. I'm sure you are. I'm sure, Joe, you'd agree, too, since you saw the theater. Yeah, oh, yeah. A, a lot of this is time and place. Yeah. Um, I saw it. I would be the same age as you, Joe, and it was a shared yep. experience with a group of guys from college. I thought it was okay. I wasn't scared by it. Okay, there you go. So okay. we got differing opinions on the extras. Well, yeah, and we're and we're gonna. Um, but Joe's, it's yeah, it's on Joe's list. So okay, great. Uh, my next one is Angel Heart. I, I really love that film. Great. Um, yeah, good movie. I'm sorry. Great movie. Just a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Um. Of course, next on my list is the Cabinet of Doctor Caligari. I was not aware that you had taken any sort of interest in that film. Just a, just a little teeny minor one, you know, considering, you know, 
Um, that is the uh, uh, highest rated film on Rotten Tomatoes, the original Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. You're it kidding. is, really? Wow. It's I got 100% know that. rating, and then they've done some kind of retro rating to it, and it, and it clocks in at like 110%, you know. Which, well, I, huh. wish, I wish all those people who That's love the film would buy a copy of The Madness of Dr. Caligari then. Um, and I should, you know what I, I should found qualify with, that uh, highest rated horror film on ah, okay. tomatoes. You know what I found with some of these movies is that, and, and I'm not saying this about Caligari at all, it just made me think of it, that some of it's the nostalgia effect. It'll get a higher score because people watched it when they were a kid or a young adult or whatnot, and they've got good memories of being scared in the theater, hmm. that type of thing. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'd so. I, and plus, to me, it's so influential. There was years and years and years where I saw still photography from the film before I actually got the opportunity to see the film. So the the buildup was huge for me. Um, and I had seen a couple of silent films beforehand, and I wasn't a real big fan. I hadn't yet... Um, gotten used to and it's not subtitles it's the fact that i'm reading subtitles when what i want is to my eye focused on the screen not i don't want to read you know because i'm afraid yeah. i'll miss something <clears throat> um <coughs> you the know next one is, is I'm let going me ahead. jump in and say something about subtitles sorry uh i'm for those who don't know i'm half deaf and in a situation like right here where I've got headphones on and everything in a quiet room, I'm okay. You know, you put me in a loud room and even if you're next to me, I can hear that you're talking, but not necessarily hear what you're saying. Well, same thing with a movie much of the time these days and it's getting worse. So I, I say all that to say this, I've got to have subtitles on almost all the time now. And it is kind of annoying, um, you know, but having to focus on the words. And, and I'm not deaf, but I'm getting older and you know we have a tv and i put in okay dr strange the blu-ray and it's mixed for i don't know 7.1 well i don't have 5.1 or 4.1 i have two so sometimes the dialogue is so friggin buried it's like what yeah, and i'm turning the volume up to 65 to try and hear two words um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So subtitles help. Yeah. But you know, again, then you're 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 concentrating on, the, on them instead of the movie. Yeah, and and I want to concentrate on the film. Um, you know, somebody stood behind a camera, um, and they put a lot of thought into you know the cinematography, and I want to see it. They put a lot of thought into the lighting. I want to see it. I, you know, I, I don't want to mix my media. When I'm reading a book, I'm reading a book. When I'm watching a film, I want to watch a film. Um, I've, I've gotten much better at it over the years because I've fallen in love with European cinema. But still, um, my, yeah. my next film is Barbarian Sound Studio. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember watching that with you at the Griffin's house. Yeah. Um, I just think it's this wonderful, brilliant examination. Uh, uh, Toby Jones is fantastic. Um, and I love... Yeah, explain, please, Joe, please explain to the audience. I'll bet a lot of people listening, I'll bet many of them have not seen this film. And please explain <laughs> what it is and why it's so horrific. All right, Toby Jones plays this quiet, mild-mannered, mama's boy, middle-aged guy from England who design, does sound design for films, often like wildlife documentaries. You know, there's birds flying over a pond. Oh, look at the nice swans with the lily pads. And he's hired, and he goes to Italy to do the sound design on a giallo film. You know, gory, brutal, bava, whoever. Um, uh, 
so what we have in the film is here's Toby Jones responsible for the sound design of the film and recording and he is watching the film this bloody horrendous giallo film and we don't see the film we hear screams we hear chopping we hear smashing we hear the sounds of the film but the only information about the film we get is through his face through watching him watch and I just think that ratchets it ratchets up the tension to an extremely high degree the sound design of the film is excellent I, I love the acting like I said I think Tony Toby Jones is brilliant in this as he often is in everything else I've seen him in um, so you know the the, the voyeur thing um, uh, and, and that's it without giving anything away um, and, and it yeah. just works this this movie absolutely was I think a labor of love and everybody in the film got it right from the lighting to the acting to you name it and and the, and the film just works marvelously I think on every level um, big big fan of that film um, okay my next one is Carpenter's The Thing, which I think is his best film, but I have a huge, huge sweet spot for The Fog. Um, I agree with Mike. The opening of the film, I adore. Um, it doesn't hurt that Adrian Barbeau was in the movie, and, like, you know... Wow, <laughs> um, but I, I I really love that film. I think th those two films by Carpenter are absolutely brilliant. Uh, my next film is Pontypool, which is the another one from my list. That's that's a brilliant movie. I'm so I'm sorry. Well, no, I, no, I, no, I, I don't mean it that way. I just mean it's. I totally agree. And it, and it's it's the only zombie movie I like. Now, I was there opening night for Night of the Living Dead or whatever the hell the name of it was, the first Romero zombie thing, which I thought was a brilliant idea and marvelously done, but I hate zombies. It's yeah. just, they, they bore me to no end. I, I don't get it. Um, well, they're so dumb and slow moving, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I want dialogue. I want something. Even if the monster doesn't talk, I, you know, make it interesting. These are people walking around that look, you know, they're hacked up and half eaten and wow, you know, big yawn. Um, so, but um, Pontypool is is my only zombie. Um, Pete Ma mentioned the Wicker Man, which. Well, I but wait a minute. Back on Pontypool, do you guys feel now? Okay, I'm not going to argue that's a zombie film <laughs> because I've. Obviously, it is. But do you guys feel also that it? I feel that it has Lovecraftian overtones. You know, uh, the I can't really say too much without giving it away. Well, I'll have to, I'll have to rewatch yeah. it. I did, that didn't connect with me in the film, but yeah, Pete. I I would say you know it has so Burroughs and Laurie Anderson at times refer to language as a virus. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so that, you know, it, and so there's that. And then Ram, I, it could be that it's Lovecraftian in reverse in that what Lovecraft did wouldn't have included that. But then when we have things like Ramsey Campbell's The Sound on the Beach or The Voices of the Beach and hmm. those kinds of stories where the monster doesn't actually have to be physical. It can be a thought or words. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, you might back into it that way. There's so much unknown. The, the, that sense of the unknown in, right. the, in the movie right. is yeah. mostly where I'm coming from, yeah. Um, and, and I also think as far as dialogue, I think it's great screenplay. Um, 
Oh yeah, I don't remember the name of that actor, but I, he was perfect for that role. That yeah, DJ role it was ab yeah, absolutely perfect. It's the caddy, I, isn't it? The caddy? I don't know. Yeah, that's right. I, the the thing is, is I don't recall. I'm I'm sure because he see he did a great job. He must be in other things, but I've never seen him in anything else that I'm aware of. Um. Uh, I don't remember if Pontypool is on Netflix right now. Of course, you can always rent it. But I will say this. There is an audio drama version of Pontypool that's, oh. I, I think, just as effective, and it's on YouTube. So well, just I think is it's it the same. It, does, does that guy? Yeah, it's the same people. It? It's the same people. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, I think he, it was originally written as a radio play or a stage drama. Mm -hmm. It's been fun, done as both. Yeah. And then the film is just like an afterthought. Yeah, it's it's as, very good. It's on YouTube. Last time I checked, as as an audio drama, that could be incredible. Um, well, sure. I mean, he's he's a DJ, and it's all about. Well, that's what I yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like the, yeah. the, the that medium to take away the visuals is wow, actually better. So, or at least in my head, it has all the potential to be better. I heard it. I heard it a couple years ago, and I thought it was really well done. If you go to YouTube and just put in Pontypool, I'm sure you'll come across it. Yeah. So. Um, my next is The Wicker Man, um, which um, I saw in the theaters and just sat there with my mouth open at the end. It was like, oh, what? Um you know, uh, the floored version of WoW. Um, this is, I'm deadly afraid of fire. Um, From Hell with Johnny Depp. I. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I I, I really enjoy the film. I don't I don't think it's a perfect film, but um, I I really like the film. There's a lot of great acting in the film. I love the story. Um, Black Sunday with Barbara Steele. Um, I hadn't ever seen that in, I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe more. Stan Sargent was showing me his, um, Barbara Steele painting, which is from Black Sunday. And I went, wow, that's great. Where, how'd you think that up? And he goes, oh, right from the movie. Like, what movie? And he told me and wait a minute, you never saw Black Sunday? It's like, no. Oh, you got to see, and I did. And I, so I, I really like Black Sunday. Um, the Awakening, which is a few years old now. It starred Rebecca Hall. Um, Very subtle ghost story. Oh, yeah. yeah, subtle ghost story. I've the, seen that twice. I really like that film. The, the, the Dollhouse. Whoa, that... That scene is one of the most effective, scary scenes in a horror movie that I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to agree. It just, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I get goosebumps the size of walnuts from the creep factor that, during that. Um, next is both Dr. Fives, the first one more than the second. But I absolutely adore the first Doctor Fives. Um, Price is perfect. Um, just a big treat for me. Um, In the Mouth of Madness, which is always my pick for Lovecraftian film, um, and that's John Carpenter too. And I think a great, in its own way, perfect film. Um, Cat turned me on to Trick or Treat, which I sat there for like a half hour beforehand thinking, oh my God, a Halloween movie, oh no, put me out of my misery. Can I please have the big one now before this starts? And I was yeah, absolutely charmed by it. I, I liked it. Yeah, and, uh, movie. I'm sorry. Trick or Treat. Trick oh, or treat. Um, it's the one with Sam, the little kid with the pumpkin head. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
I don't yeah. even mind the gore in the film, and normally I have absolutely zero use for gore. That said, I love the Silence of the Lambs. Um, I I like the Wolfman with Del Toro and Hopkins from 2010. I I don't like Wolf Wolfman stories. I don't like Wolfman movies. Um except for the thing, the fact that Wolfman, if you just describe it, it should be perfect for me. Um, and yet, all those Wolfman films over the years, I never really liked any of them. So the, the one with Del Toro, that one is as close as I'm ever going to get to one I like. Hellboy. Um, uh, uh, Cronin is that the character's name? Um, that that I think is an incredible creation. Oh, um, the the clockwork, the sense. clockwork, yeah, just gets to me. It's like wow, I would give a finger or two to have come up with that character. Um, okay, let me let me get in trouble now. I like Constantine a lot. Yeah, that movie's a piece of crap. <laughs> um, I even the phone thing. So. I think the guy who plays the devil in the film—that's my second favorite interpretation portrayal of the devil. My first one is De Niro in Angel Heart. Um, uh, I. You know, but yeah, Constantine. Um, well, uh, Tilda Swinton. Oh, in this film. Tilda Swinton. She's the die for. Yeah, I'd watch. I'd watch a two-hour movie of her literally reading the phone book. Um, really? Because that's what uh, Only Lovers Left Alive was, and I really like that. Well, that's the next movie on on my list. Is Only Lovers Left Alive? I I, I think. That's a perfect vampire film. It um, is, but it's not a horror film, in my opinion. No, but it's a vampire film, and I didn't have one on the list, so... Yeah. Well, I, I do no, have, it's a It's a damn good movie. And, and actually, I spoke too soon, because I, I did add a vampire film right after I put Only Lovers Left Alive on my list, which is uh, Carl Theodore Dreiser's Silent Vampire. Um, v a m p y r. It's it's a silent film. Um, the it has a nightmare scene in it, which I think may be as fine a nightmare scene as in the history of cinema. Um, its atmospherics are just to die for. Um, it's it's in part a, uh, a, a a film based on Camilla, the uh, what's his name, Lafanu story. <coughs> um, next is Jaws. Um, I, I agree with you guys when you said that you don't see the creature for a long time. That just really ratches it, ratchets up expectation. Um, where they're sitting in the galley comparing scars, that scene bothers me immensely. Um, I really love The Shining. Um, it's my Stephen King film. And my last one on my list, because I figured I'd better stop at some point, is Shutter Island. I love the book, and I love the film. And, it, man, there's so many scenes in that movie that just bother me to no end. I, you know, because he talks the the author, who is it? Uh, Dennis Lehane. Yeah. He talks about how he tried to write that novel for years, and every time he tried to write it, 
he ran up into the roadblock that that was you know it's completely unbelievable if you have a, a phone or a cell phone or a computer or a television or you know any any way to communicate with the rest of the world right and so that's how it devolves into this sort of period uh 1920s 30s piece in the middle of a hurricane oh i i didn't real i i just assumed he he didn't that start with that, that because was of solution. the isolation not that he sat and thought about it for a long time no, he, he he kept trying to write it. At least this is how I remember. He kept trying to write it. It kept running into these problems, and he en finally ends up having to just go back in time. And even then, that's not enough. You have to go into this sort of island and isolation, and and even then, in the middle of a storm. Yeah, well, that's what I meant. You're on an island. The 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 severity of the storm. You're completely cut off. It, yep. It's 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 like alien. You know you. Yes. You there is nowhere for you to go. Yep. You know it, it's 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 like you're in a closed room with a monster. So. Yeah. Uh, Kelly. Uh, what? Sorry, I was dozing there for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to be boring. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I was under the impression that this was a uh, list of go-to films. So I, I've, um, I've got a couple that are my, my literal go-to is Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter from Hammer Films. Um, I just love this movie so much, and it was originally supposed to be a, uh, a series of films, and it, it ended up being serialized in comic book form in Hammer's... Uh, Hammer Horror Magazine, I think. And so that was kind of neat, but that's one I'd really love to see remade because I think it's just a really fun movie. Um, <clears throat> as far as going into the satanic films, I love The Omen, 1976, uh, Beyond All, and mostly because of that amazing sound design. There's so much stuff going on in there, but there's a, a scene of one of the guard Rottweilers coming around the corner in the hallway as Gregory Peck is trying to kidnap his son so he can kill him. And <laughs> the dog is panting, so you're hearing this, <sighs> but underneath that, they have layered this uh, chorus of anti-Christo, 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 and it just gives me chills every time I hear it. It's all for you, Damien. Oh, it's it's, it's the best. <laughs> it's the best as far as those satanic films go. And, I know the Exorcist and, really started that whole thing in the seventies, but <clears throat> I think the Omen, for whatever reason, uh, you know, the the gravitas of Gregory Peck in your horror film is well. That, isn't that isn't that the whole point? You know, of, of bring you know bringing in Gregory Peck or George C. Scott. You yeah, love... George C. Scott and the Changeling. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you'll you'll buy and, that. And you're stuff. right. You're right, Kelly. It's just I got to like twenty five and went I, I gotta stop somewhere. So <laughs> and, and but that's certainly an incredible film. If I hadn't seen The Exorcist first, the omen would but the Exorcist popped my cherry, so Sure. I think that's why it's higher. Um, so as far as bringing in uh, serious actors into your horror film, I really love um, Don't Look Now with Donald Sutherland. I think that is a, a very, very scary movie. Mm -hmm. It's got a really creepy sex scene in it. Uh, and it's a, it's a haunted house ghost story which you know is one i always love and then to continue my donald sutherland love uh invasion of the body snatchers 78 is just brilliant this is a film that i will watch once a year uh it, it, leonard nimoy trying to break away from spock and does so wonderfully in that it's just a a, a perfect movie yeah i gotta rewatch um, that that's a great one yeah uh, Brian De Palma's adaptation of Carrie is brilliant. I love the split screen 
uh, climax with everything happening. You're watching Carrie shift her eyes and then the prom sign is catching on fire. And George Lucas had this great story of how, uh, you know, he and De Palma and Spielberg all went to school together and they loved the standing in line for the next showing of Carrie because you would hear, you would literally hear the audience scream and then they'd file out and everybody in line was like, Oh Jesus, what the fuck happens at the end of this movie? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that one I love, even though I don't think it's a, um, a perfect adaptation of the story. I think it is the finest Stephen King film. So I recently rewatched Phantom of the Paradise, mm. which is sort of like where Brian <clears throat> De Palma use, first uses the, the split screen effect that's right i forgot about that really well um and so it's sort of prelude to 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 carry and and so it's, it covers some of the same themes too so right. yeah plus you and know the, the music. I, I never i never saw carrie i hated the book i didn't like the book at all so it's like screw the film Oh, I, I love the book and I love the film. Um, I I love Jaws also. I think it's it is probably my favorite horror film of all time. But I think the strength of that movie is in the scenes in between the horror, when yeah. Brody is sitting at the dinner table with his son and his son is mimicking everything he's doing, and you can just see the the stress that Brody is under as he's trying to figure out what to do with this, you know, remember he's afraid of the water. He took this job. He was a New York cop that was trying to get into a less stressful job. Um, it's just such a brilliant film and it's all because of the human moments, not the shark moments. And it's why every imitation shark film afterwards failed because they didn't understand that it wasn't about the shark. It, it's well, never yeah, about that's the shark. Said, when, when they're complete comparing scars down in the galley and, and 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 Quint is telling them about delivering the bomb yes that, 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 that is that is we we not only is it brilliantly acted by by all three of them but it's pure character yeah but you know, does it doesn't also reset the tension you shit the the, there was tension built up by the shark, and then you've got to defuse that tension and shift it yeah. someplace else before you start it up again. Right. The next shark scene. Well, and and there's there's Quinn talking about being in the water with these things around, and such and such next two bodies over, you know, he pops up and he's missing everything from his hips down, and it's like. Yeah. I mean, even even the dialogue in that scene keeps ratcheting up the tension for us. So let yeah. me ask you a question, Kelly. Have you read the book? Yes. Because in the book, there's even more tension because Cooper's sleeping with Brody's wife. See, right. That, that absolutely didn't work. Right, which was a very smart thing to draw from the yeah, film. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I think the movie was much better than the book. Um, uh, to continue, to, uh, excuse me, to continue on, um, I love Alien for a lot of the same reasons. I love The Omen because of the sound design, that hum of the ship that is just constant throughout is, uh, is really eerie. And they, there's some recording on YouTube that is just the engine noise of the, of the, uh, mining ship they're on. And it's, um, yeah, and it's Stromo. Yeah, it's soothing, but it's also very, very unsettling at the same time. Um, and then as we get into the 21st century, uh, The Descent by Neil Marshall, I think, is just about a perfect horror film with uh, five very strong female leads, spelunkers who go into a cavern that has not been explored in hundreds of years and then find out that there is something down there with them, which has kind of a Lovecraftian feel to it a, a well, bit. Well, it's, it's sort of like the lurking fear. Right. Right. 
And then finally, one that I just love and continue to go back to is Del Toro's uh, The Devil's Backbone, which is probably my favorite depiction of ghosts on film. I Man. just think that that is a, a haunting movie. Another one where the, the moral of the story is, of course, that humans are the real monsters. But in this case, it's uh, much more subtle than Nightbreed. And it's yeah. much, the humans are much more monstrous. And, and, and in some ways, sort of a, a, a thematic prequel to his uh, later film. Um, Pan's Labyrinth? All, yes. Yes. The, you know, a dress rehearsal for what he wanted to do there and go back and talk about the Spanish Civil War. and Yeah. And you know, that movie was based, or he was inspired to uh, create that movie because he said his uncle haunted him when he was a child and it would his ghost would sit in the corner of the room and talk to him or something to that effect. Wow, I did not yeah. hear that. Google, Google that. I don't have that exactly right, but it's something like that. So I'll Google that. If it's on the internet, you know. It's, it's got to be true. It's got to be true, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. So that that's my list of go-to films. I see these, if not once a year, then every other year. But with Captain Kronos, that's every single year. I, and right around Halloween. I just love that film. That is also noteworthy for being Caroline Monroe's best movie. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Kelly, did did you tell me that you've seen The Creature Below? Or was that somebody else? Yeah, I saw that one. It's a supposedly Lovecraftian. I haven't seen it. How, how is The Creature Below? Is it worth seeing? It's worth seeing. It's also very low budget. Um, and it is not supposedly Lovecraftian. There are lines of dialogue <laughs> taken from from Lovecraft's books throughout. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. These guys are, are big fans, obviously. Yeah. Renting? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's got some slow moments in it, but if, if what you're looking for, as all of us are, are fans of films that have Lovecraftian elements in it, you could do a lot worse than The Creature Below. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Matt, you have a few movies? Yeah, now see, my perspective is different. I am not an aficionado. I really don't like gory or slasher movies. And I was brought up on Universal Monsters, uh, 60s Giant Monsters, and Hammer films. So like, I could sit and watch a marathon of like Monolith Monsters, uh, The Deadly Mantis, and The Monster That Challenged the World, and I'll be quite happy, and everyone else will say, this is all crap. Okay, so I made my list of movies that actually really raised my hackles at some point and just completely freaked me out. Now, I don't know that uh, these are exactly horror movies, but... That's fine. Um, did you ever see Suddenly Last Summer with Elizabeth Taylor? Now, yeah. there is a scene... I haven't, no. When she's trying to recall how someone's son died, and it's near the end of the movie, and the tension just ratchets up unbearably, and he may well have been cannibalized. Yeah, I saw that. That is that is incredibly effective scene. And and I just remember seeing that as a little kid. It's like I was creeped out for like the rest of my life. Okay, no one's mentioned this Diabolique. Uh, from the 1950s, an extremely unnerving French horror movie. For a while, people would say it was scarier than any other movie. But for a long time, it was rated like number one list of terrifying movies. Because that plays into my third choice, which again, I'm surprised no one mentioned Psycho. Because... That still blows me away at how, at the, uh, the indirection, the uh, person just swallowed up by events that have nothing to do with their problems. It scared the bejesus out of me. Um, okay. The Trilogy of Terror, the TV movie from 1975. Especially yes. that little voodoo doll. I the Zuni fetish doll. Okay, I was like, when it came out, what was I, 16, 17 maybe? 
I was like hiding behind the couch watching it. It was so well done. <laughs> and just, you know, peering around the couch. Oh, my God, it's coming again. Ah, no, don't answer the door. Uh, terrifying. And you talk about Jaws, but what about Duel? Stephen King's original run out. Yeah. A faceless, nameless monster. I'm mean, not Stephen King, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, it's with a truck. Yeah, okay. Now, my dedication to monster movies translated into me loving a couple of action horror movies. So everyone says Alien is great. I loved Aliens also. The second Alien movie was just brilliant. Similarly, my favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I, I agree, but I think part, part of the reason I think it's brilliant is because it, it's a rock and roll war movie. Right. I well, mean, that's one of the reasons I liked I, it. If we had attempted to remake Alien, I think it would fall completely flat. But we come back with a roller coaster, and I love the juxtaposition, as well as there's tons of things in the film. But that was one of the reasons I thought it worked so well. But there's another, uh, like my favorite Arnold movie of all time is always going to be Conan. I don't care how bad it is or whatever. Um, <coughs> Predator. What a bloody brilliant movie. S nerve Predator 2. Oh, come on. Predator. Yeah, now you're being silly. <laughs> I'll actually agree with, with Joe here that I like Predator 2 better. Mute, mute again, please. Uh, <laughs> now, Predator was a better movie. Okay. I, I, I'm always mad on this one. I'm glad we all agree. Well, and since Rick's with me, it means I'm right. I've it in the past. Um, okay, now the last movie I'm going to mention wasn't really a horror movie, but it was an homage to horror that I just adore, and that's Ed Wood. Edward with Johnny Depp. I, sure. I love that movie. Yeah, you can't you can't not like that movie. So w wonderful my, film. My movies are more. Maybe they aren't on other people's tops lists, but they're the ones that just creep me out. And I gotta say, in college, I was persuaded to go to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and that also creeped me the hell out. <laughs> I was at the drive-in when that opened, and somebody towards the back of the lot started a fucking chainsaw. <coughs> you, uh, I'm surprised that my underwear did not turn brown. And every car door in the entire drive-in burst open everybody jumped out um but i agree it's it, it, it it's a great film it's just not on my i'll never watch it again i you know saw it once on video afterward but you know uh, it's, it's, these are movies that, 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 that caused me a lot of tension and scared and creeped me the heck out so that's how i made my choices well again texas chainsaw massacre and night of the living dead that they almost come out of nowhere in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a way. You're just like, whoa, you know. And movies with creep factor is King Solomon's Mines. We have the village and the natives, you know, they got feathers and paint and they're jumping up and down and they're grunting and there's sounds. And we have, the, it, you know, it's implied they're cannibals. And that was, as a little kid, the first time that I ever came across cannibalism. And it's like, people eating people? Whoa. Um, Rick, are the you? hungriest people in the world. Oh, okay. That's right. Okay. You're up, Rick. Is that finished? Yeah, yeah. that's pretty much it. I didn't want to... I, I just... Okay. Wants to creep me out. All right. I cross. I'm trying. I'm, not, I'm trying to avoid duplicates here. Okay. For silent horror movies, the movie that creeped the heck out of me was Nosferatu, and which is a ripoff of Dracula. 
when it was originally made? Because they weren't allowed to use. They want Murnau was not allowed to use Dracula. So yeah, but just just tell a, little, a quick little story on that. When I was a kid, I couldn't stand. I was scared the heck of the Wolfman and Frankenstein monster till I was about seven or eight years old. Dracula, I could watch, Lugosi. And the one time we saw the, started to, we, we always used to see Abbott and Costello uh, meet Frankenstein, and I would close my eyes every time the monster and the wolfman was on, but I would watch Lugosi. So finally, the original Dracula comes on. I'm all ready to watch it. My brother, who doesn't get scared by anything, gets scared by Dracula. Doesn't like the <laughs> guys getting out of the coffin in this movie. Liked it okay in Abbott Costello. Turned the damn TV off. So I'm, and it's taking a long while for it to come back. So I suddenly find, oh, it's going to be a, I just saw a commercial for Dracula. I turn on it and it just scares me out of my mind. It's Nosferatu, this hairless guy. So that's why I will always have, always be frightened by that movie. It's such a iconic design. It is a terrifying look for the monster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it, it is, and there's a couple of scenes in there that are phenomenal. But my, my, my first encounter with vampires is Dracula, Lugosi. And it didn't bother me. I didn't like Lugosi. I, if I had liked it, fine. But they just turned me off to vampires at an early age. All right. Um, Let's get, I'll get into a vampire discussion here because i got a lot of vampire movies here. Uh, well, well, no, let me hold off. I want to stay in period. German horror. Testament of Dr. Malbuza. You may consider it a crime drama rather than a horror movie, but it's got a ghost in it. It's influenced by Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. It's one of the greatest movies ever made. And directed by Fritz Slang. And he did another movie, which we were talking about, psychological horror, M. Oh, gosh, that was almost on my list. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about child, children in yep. danger. That movie knows how to do it with scaring the heck out of you, but doing it tastefully. Mm-hmm. Now, universal horror movies. You went through everything I had in Frankenstein with one exception, Joe. Son of Frankenstein, which I okay. like because it has an ensemble acting. Call it's got call offs, least in he doesn't get as much screen time as the monster, doesn't get to do as much. But it's more than made up by Basil Rathbone, makes the best mass scientist in the Universal Horror movie. Bela Lugosi has his best role, better than Dracula, Igor. Yep, and Lionel Atwell is incredible as that one armed police inspector. Which was, you see, most of you. Or most of the audience, well, you've just seen the parody of that role in Young Frankenstein. Well, Young Frankenstein is a parody of the whole son of Frankenstein. Right, it is. But I, yeah. I was saying Lionel Atwell was great in that movie. And if not for Lugosi, no, but, I would have said it would have been the best performance. Yeah, I, I agree. Again, part of this was I looked down and realized I had like 27 movies on my list that I thought, Davis is going to kill me. So yeah. I stopped. That's, but, that's fine. You know, I, I was saying I agree with you. On the, I'm just going to mention the one that was omitted. Now, the, that, that movie had every great universal horror story except George Zuko. George Zuko made a lot of B movies, but he made one universal horror movie that's great, The Mad Ghoul, which is about uh, digging up corpses and taking their hearts out to make this... Uh, Serum that uh, puts you in a living death state. And that movie is unique. I, it, for Most universal horror movies don't end on a note of horror. They either have comic relief or they end with the hero and the girl, you know, they just killed Beto Lugosi or Boris Koloff and they're going off into the sunset and we'll probably forget all this horrible stuff. That Mad Ghoul is one of the few Universal horror movies that ends on a note of horror. I'm not going to say what the ending is. I'll have to see that. I've never seen it. 
uh, old time horrible. It's probably on YouTube. Dr. X was Lionel Atwell. That has that's a great who done it for a horror movie. I did not guess who the killer was when I saw it when I was fourteen or fifteen. Uh, with psychological horror movies, there's a movie called Hangover Square with Lad Kreger, who plays a uh, psychotic killer who's also a pianist. Has one of the best movie scores ever I've I've ever heard by Bernard Herrmann, who also later did Psycho. Uh, so, what was the um, Camilla movie you mentioned before? Uh, Carl Dreiser's Vampire. Okay, I just because I, I I missed which one. I've got another Camilla movie then, Blood and Roses, which is Roger Valdez. It's got some great. Great dream sequence in it, and two gorgeous actresses, one of which is uh, Elsa Martinelli. That, that's an incredibly stylized horror movie. Uh, Hammer films. Kelly took my um, favorite one away, <laughs> which was Captain Cronus. But in the other ones, I love Horror of Dracula. The first Christopher Lee one. I think he's only on Dracula. He's only plays Dracula probably for 10 minutes. But all the scenes he has are great. And the fight scene with Peter Cushing in the end is terrific. Frankenstein must be destroyed was Peter Cushing. Which is, his, uh, uh, which is my favorite of the Frankenstein movies they did at Hammer. Because they went outside the box. He's not creating a monster this time. He's trying, he's doing something more along the lines of Donovan's brain. The problem with the current DVD version is that they restored a rape scene that wasn't in the original that shouldn't, it shouldn't be in the movie. Makes no sense for it. They wisely cut it before. They put it in there just for uh, exploitation purposes. Take that out and it's the perfect film. Uh, I like the original Hammer Mummy, which uh, the the Lon Chaney Jr. version was slow as molasses. The uh, Christopher Lee version can tear your house to pieces. You can't outrun this guy. He moves fast. He's strong. He's incredible. Uh, I like uh, zombie movies from Hammer, Plague of the Zombies, which doesn't have any uh, major stars from Hammer, but it's a great film. And they always were showing sequences from it on uh, Amazing Stories by Steven Spielberg or whatever. That, that, that one got ripped off a lot. If they wanted to have a scene of somebody going to see a horror movie, they took us, they took us shot from Plague of the Zombies. Uh, Curse of the Demon is based on an M.R. James story, Casting the Runes, love that. Loved uh, also Cat People, which is a, has a beautiful French actress, whose name I think is Simone, Simone Simon. And she's also in another movie called The Devil and Daniel Webster, which has John Huston. Excuse me, has Walter Huston, John Huston's father, as the devil. And he, and to me, he was the best devil in a movie. Uh, I'm going to go into some Dan Curtis films. Jack Palance is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Has a great, before, besides a great performance by uh, Palance, it's got this cool sword cane in there, which I loved as a kid. Uh, House, House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows. That's because I love the TV series. Rick, but, can, can, can I ask you a question? Sure. You, you just mentioned Jack Palance. Some, sometime in the mid the the early to mid seventies, 
during one of Jerry Lewis's uh, muscular dystrophy talent, uh, the telethons, um, Jerry Lewis presented a Jack, short Jack Palance black and white film. I mean, apparently he twisted Jack Palance's arm to make it, where Jack Palance actually portrays muscular dystrophy and tells people why they shouldn't donate, what they will deprive him of. Um, it's not a horror film, but it's absolutely the most bone-chilling thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Yeah, uh, I've got to look that it's up. It's not on YouTube. I've never been able to. We, I was on a trip. It just happened to be that was what was on TV. Was sitting there. Jerry Lewis said, "No." Oh, now here comes Jack Palance, and I said, "Because it was Jack Palance," and here comes this little short, few-minute film. Devastating. Sorry. No problem. No, you can feel free to interrupt me. Uh, the original Night Stalker, the TV movie with Darren McGavin as Cold Jack. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you, Rick, do you prefer that over the TV series or do you like the TV series up better? Uh, that the, the movie is much better than the TV series. It established all, all the tropes of the whole one. I, I, I love the TV. I would say the only episode which came close well, to, well, there probably are about three or four. I, I, I'm forgetting now. Not. But I like the Ripper one. I liked uh, Horror and the Heights. I like They Are, They Will Be, whatever. Yeah, those are the two best, in my opinion. Or in the Heights, and uh, they have been, they are, they will be. Does anybody know why we've never seen a, a more Kolchak movies or anybody's tried to reboot the series? They it did. It just seems like... Well, they, they, oh. did, they, did, they, did, they did a lousy job of it, and it failed. 2005, yeah. yeah oh, I, I didn't see or hear about it. Oh. Yeah, it was awful. It just with all, all the love for Kolchak, it just seems like that would be, you know, yeah. if it was done right, people would flock to that. Yeah, and the, the problem is, is when you when you have a, a beloved series or, or something like that, and somebody comes along and tries to reboot it and fails, it. good luck trying to get it redone. You know, oh, oh I, re I realize once you muddy, <laughs> muddy, once you muddy the water, you screwed the pooch, but... Right. It's like, and 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 I I think McGavin is just so perfect in the role, yeah. but that's something that, you know, if you could get the right person to do it. Well, maybe one reason Rick liked the movie so much is it was written by Richard Matheson. Yes, yeah, it was definitely. Rick, I I think that the city of I, I don't disagree with you by the way, but I think that the city of Chicago is a character in a way that Las Vegas in Seattle wasn't. Uh, I, was. I, I'll agree with that. Yeah. Okay. This, uh, Matthew mentioned Trilogy of Terror. There was a sequel to Trilogy of Terror, Trilogy of Terror 2. And it was an actress named Lizette Anthony, very good British actress, doing three segments. The last one is the sequel to The Doll. The doll comes back. Nice. And it's just as terrifying. Yeah, that's right. That, and uh, kind of no, like I the first watched. one, it's really the only one that's worth watching. Well, the that. first, it, it, well, the other two aren't bad. The first segment in Trilogy of Terror 2 is an adaptation of Henry Cutner's Graveyard Rats with a woman. So it's borderline Cthulhu mythos. And the other one is about a woman who brings her son back to life, which is actually a remake of a segment on a previous anthology movie by um, Dan Curtis called uh, Dead at Night, which did it better. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Okay, just some uh, quick science fiction movies. 
We all love the thing by John Carpenter, but uh, let me give a shout out to the original thing, even though, I mean, by comparison, the monster isn't as frightening. The one, this is the one with James Arness, but it's got a good ending. Watch the skies that creeped me out as a kid. Uh, Day of the Triffids, those giant carnivorous man-eating plants. Scared the hell out of me as a kid. No, you know, I use that in conversation, like if there's big plants around and no one understands <laughs> what the heck I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and if you're going to go to that era for sci-fi, them. Yeah, well, I, I, you just took away the, last, the next one on my list. Oh, okay, I was cool. I say them. Cool. Giant ants. And kids in trouble, too. Yeah. Uh, I I liked Dr. Fives, as Joe said, so I have to give him some other Vincent Price movies here. The Tingler. Oh, The Tingler. Yeah. That was one of the best um, endings of a horror movie I've ever seen. Well, because it's also a murder mystery, right? Right, but 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 I'm just saying, not only the way it ends, the, the little voiceover by Vincent Price at the end. Don't scream. Well, Vincent Price is, is awesome so in anything that he does. Yeah. All right, we better wrap up soon. You have uh, any I'll, other? I'll, I'll, I'll just have a few. Okay. Um, just have to go into Roger Corman uh, horror movies, The Raven, P Pit and the Pendulum, oh, Mask the of the Red Death, Tomb of Ligia, Premature uh, Burial, which has uh, Ray Milan rather than Vincent Price. And I, uh, I like Cabin in the Woods for the modern era. I like that, too. I was surprised they did. Army of Darkness, from uh, which is you know, was the Necronomicon or whatever. It's a comedy more than a horror movie, I think, but I enjoyed it. And since we were mentioning psychological horror, last is Sisters by Brian De Palma. It's a good was, movie. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of things with split the kill for the film though. I, I, I have to go back and add one more movie I forgot, which mm -hmm. still creeps me out. That's The Birds. One of the best oh, movies ever made. Yeah. I forgot that. All right, and I just I'm gonna add two more. Um Whatever Happened to Baby Jane mm. which is just horrific. Is anybody watching this new series? Du uh, duel? Uh, no, yeah. Joan, Joan, and yeah, <laughs> Betty and Joan, whatever, whatever. It's brilliant! Oh Ooh. my god! Yep. What is it? I don't, I don't, I don't think I've even heard of it. it what is it? Feud. Feud. It's about the making of uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane. Oh, okay. Susan Sarandon plays Betty Davis. Oh, of course she does. Jessica Lang plays Don Crawford. I haven't watched it. And then, huh. you know, people give me shit for this, but I think it's the greatest zombie movie ever made. John Carpenter's Assault on Precinct 13. <laughs> you're, you're... And people give you shit for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, because it's not billed as a zombie movie and they're not called zombies. They're gangbangers. But it follows the zombie formula formula perfectly it's a bunch of guys who don't want to be there together and who are at odds with each other trapped in a building surrounded by faceless and voiceless creatures people that are trying to kill them well this, it's yeah. a great movie in in that regard the hateful eight by uh well western. that's a that's the thing that's because, the thing that's the thing as a western yes mike we haven't heard All your right. list. I'll keep it short, but, uh, it, you know, first of all, I want to tell everybody that the burrowers, I need to make a new list of Netflix and Amazon prime, <laughs> uh, soon, but the burrowers is on Amazon prime. That's a Lovecraftian film. So check that out. If you got Amazon prime, hmm. um, I recently, I've kind of been on a little bit of a, 
70s and 80s horror kick. So I recently rewatched The Changeling with George C. Scott. Um, damn good movie. Creepy movie. It never has a oh, red yeah. ball seemed so scary. Yeah, exactly. Well, wasn't, exactly that the, right. wasn't that the, 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 cart or the commercial? The yeah, ball? It, it is terrifying. Yeah, and that's that's the special effect, the ball bouncing down the stairs. Scary as hell. Well, uh, and, what, and you're going to tell other... me they didn't steal that from him? Uh, yeah, that's what I thought of when you mentioned it. I haven't seen the tank but I agree with Mike, but I, I still think the bouncing ball is a nod to M. Yeah. The other movie that I watched uh, was this Sentinel, which I don't think I'd, I'd ever seen before. I recently watched that the other night. I don't know. I wasn't all that impressed with it, but I will tell you what. I don't know if you guys have seen the Sentinel. I'm, I'm guessing this you, is most the, of you probably have. This is the uh, gateway to hell. And, uh, yeah, with yeah. Chris Sarandon? With everybody you know, Chris Meredith, Jeff Goldblum, uh, Christina Raines is the actress. I mean, there are more people that you've heard of in that movie: Jerry Orbach, Jeff Goldblum, in all kinds of supporting roles. It's amazing. Even the guy at the very end, who's on on the screen for thirty seconds, that's Tom Berenger, you know, in an early role. <laughs> so there are so oh, many. The guy who rents the apartment is Tom Berenger. Okay. No, 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 no. Later at the end. No, I mean at the, at end, the very at end of the, the end. movie. Uh, at the, at the, yeah. The meals rents the apartment. Oh, rents the apartment then. Yes, that's Tom Berenger. So, <laughs> quite a young looking Tom Berenger. And then. Um, but uh, I was going to ask I, another one from, I think, the 70s, right, that I've not seen is Burnt Offerings. Should I, should I watch that one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. you should. It's, it's very offbeat. Um, mm hmm. And yeah, you should watch it. All right. And you learn something you shouldn't do at the end of a horror movie. Yes. Well, I would say what well, the same thing happens in Night of Dark Shadows too. Wait, okay. and isn't Burgess Meredith in that one too? Yes, he is actually. There you go. Yeah. But I'm just saying that it, it, this is this is like things you shouldn't do in a horror movie 101. Those, if you know what I'm saying, I'm saying. No, no, don't do that. So I don't remember if anybody mentioned It Follows, but I like that movie. Um, I thought it was very effective. Um, a mo another movie that I think is very suspenseful, very effective is What Lies Beneath with Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, that's a great flick. I just, I could, I've watched that probably four times. That's a really good film. Thanks for reminding me. I'm going to put that on my list to watch again. Yeah, isn't that a good movie? That's great. Um, t t Stephen King movie, Silver Bullet. That's a good one. The other Stephen King movie that I like is Salem's Lot from, which, which what, 79? Yeah. Yeah, 1979. Both are good, but the first one is... I'm talking about Nosferatu. They obviously modeled the uh, the vampire look Mar off of Nosferatu. Yeah, he's, he, 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 the vampire looks normal in the remake, which was still good but uh. we've started a tradition in the davis household now that my son's older he's 14 now and you know he's he's obviously when he's younger he can't watch horror movies but now we the three of us watch horror movies uh once every week or two after the sun goes down and the objective is to scare logan's mom as much as possible so we try to find the scariest movie that we can you're a bad man. Yeah, well, You're a very that, that, bad that, that, man. It makes Logan That's happen. That's a great way to score points with your wife, Davis. So recently we watched, in that tradition, we watched uh, The Conjuring. Have you guys seen that? And The yeah. Conjuring 2. I thought those were actually pretty good movies. And yeah. I was expecting to think that I was expecting that they would be average. But I thought I, they were pretty effective. I like both of those. My only um, my only gripe about those movies is I can't remember what's the name of the couple ghost hunters. Yeah, like, I know they're nothing like that in real life. Yeah. Not only they're, that, but they're I, yeah. they're complete pieces of shit in real That's life. That's what I heard. Yeah. 
<laughs> the problem, That's what I heard. And there's such nice people in the movie, but I heard in real life they're just yeah. And I, I just hate to think that there's any kind of money going into their pockets from these movies. Well, sure they're about to lose it all. And Patrick Why? Wilson is such a great actor. So, um, oh, it, yeah. it turns out that the guy who wrote the their first book, the Demonologist, he has come forth with a contract that gave him exclusive rights to all their stories. Oh, ouch. Are you serious? And, uh, yeah. And, wow. um, the, 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 uh, production company came back and said, well, it's not fiction. It's historical fact. So you can't copyright historical fact. And he's like, I made up most of this shit. You stole from me. <laughs> <laughs> so even even if you, we were going to, you know, you know, apparently the whole concept of that farm being haunted by a witch was a made up concept. Well, and, there were a few um, jump scares in that movie, but by and large, I enjoy movies like um, What Lies Beneath and just very subtle horror movies uh, of that nature. Another one like that. Sorry, what, Matt? Would you then put the sixth sense on that list? I would. Sure. Yeah. That would... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I really, uh, the I other really one that really I liked that, that was the other one that I liked that was released that same year uh, was uh stir of echoes. I thought that yep. was really well. Done. Oh yeah. Another Matheson. Was Sorry. Big. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is Richard Matheson. Um, another I'd lump in with with that is the others. That one is brilliant. I love yeah. that movie. Yeah, that with Awakening Why, and the like Innocence that. is a is a, like a great triple feature. Um, just, just one more. I've never seen a TV movie or movie written by Richard Matheson, which hasn't been great. Yeah, that's probably true. What was that last one, Mike? I missed it. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. The others. What? The others. So there are about five versions of the Omega Man, or the last man on Earth, and Richard Matheson is responsible for all of them. <laughs> Just... Yeah, but yeah, last man on Earth like the, is excellent. The screenplay for, for uh, I don't think, any of them. Yeah, so, so last man on Earth and Omega Man are great. Um, uh, the Will Smith version is right, but but th th those are adaptations of his work. He's not the guy yeah. writing the screenplay. Yeah, I know. I just all right. So in that vein, I'd also throw in the Woman in Black, which I thought was extremely well done. Yeah. Um, I told the author that once, and she replied that she totally agreed. She thought the movie did her book justice um that's actually a remake for those it was a tv movie which i've not seen but i heard was not that good but the one with the kid from harry potter was was really great daniel radcliffe that's his name um yeah what did i say the woman in black and then session nine is just creepy as hell so I watched, it's been 15 years now, I need to rewatch the movie, but I remember watching some of the DVD extras and the actors were talking about being on the roof of that place, hearing voices, telling them to jump and things like that. So Yeah, they shot that. Was that at Danvers? I don't that? remember. I believe, because I was doing research recently on Danvers, the answer I believe is yes. Yeah, they've managed to get access to that just before it was torn down. So yeah. what an opportunity. Oh, it was torn down. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then it burned down, right? The rebuild burnt down? Oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm thinking about a different asylum, but yeah. I said the new daughter. No, I don't think I've said the new daughter yet. I'm a big fan of the new daughter. I couldn't yeah. tell. Yeah. Are you? Couldn't tell? Nope. Very well done movie. Uh, has anybody seen, I've not seen this yet. Has anybody seen Mr. Jones? Because I've heard it is Lovecraftian. I love Mr. Jones. It has some problems, 
but it's a good movie. Okay. Is it Lovecraftian? Or does it have yes. Lovecraftian yes. theme? Yeah. It's um, Pikmin's model done with cosmic horror themes. Okay. So, All right. So it, is it good enough that we should waste an hour and a half watching it? Yes, but you know, go into it knowing that they had a limited budget and you know that you might have to rewatch the ending. Okay. Of course, we've mentioned Absentia on this show before, which has got quite the Lovecraftian theme. Spectacular. Yeah. Wonderful film. And then Kelly and I talked about this recently, a few months ago, The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Oh, yeah. I thought it was very effective. I haven't seen it. That was probably my favorite movie of last year. Really? Mm. Yeah, it it really creeped me out. Yeah, very well done. Um, I'll throw in one from TV, too. It's it's more of a detective show, but it's kind of a a horror detective show. It's called Whitechapel. Um, Set in London, of course. And it's set in modern-day London. And the first, it's, it's four seasons... Uh, four series as British TV calls them and the first one is three episodes and it's a Jack the Ripper copycat and it's a lot less boring than it sounds it's very effective I think very well done I really love the camaraderie between the characters as well getting to know each other and then in season two and three and four is there anything supernatural that happens in that or is it Is not in the first three seasons. In season four, there is. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's real interesting. Mm. But uh, I, you know, it's on Amazon Prime right now, and I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Oh, so I got it written down. This has been a great episode for me. I've got a bunch of stuff that I need to check out. And if you're going to get into TV, I just fell in love with Penny Dreadful. Um, I mean, they're has problems here and there, but overall, I I loved it to death. Well, anyone out there who's listening or you guys, if you watch, I'm such a fan of Whitechapel that if you watch it, let me know what you thought of it because I'm really interested to see what you think of it. I wish they would make more seasons of it, but I don't think that's going to happen. So... Uh, that that's a BBC production, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one they, of the detectives. Do, yeah, they do such marvelous stuff. The BBC is just incredible. One of, the, one of the detectives is that guy in the first season of Sherlock, uh, who the cab driver. I don't want to give anything. Away oh, okay. Anybody. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Bill Davis is his name. Mm-hmm. So. White hair, grumpy guy in the in the White Chapel series. It's, he's great. Mm. So, yeah. Danielle wants to know if we're related. White hair and grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, guys, thanks. I appreciate it. Hey, Mike. I wanted to mention. Um, I yeah. caught that movie Life in theaters. Oh yes, the and Get Out. Talk about Life and Get Out before we go. Oh, man, Get Out. I I finally saw Get Out, and I thought to myself, there's just no way this film can live up to the hype, and yet it did. I thought it was absolutely brilliant, just really, really strong storytelling. Um, It's – I don't want to say anything to give it away. It's uh, it's got some nice social commentary, uh, really well written, very well directed, and um, definitely worth seeing. Um, Life – I liked a lot, very reminiscent of Alien, uh, except they're in orbit around Earth. But uh, what was most pleasing was Ryan Reynolds dropping a um, a nod to Reanimator in the first 15 minutes of the film. <laughs> and I thought, well, what? well yeah, Lovecraft has, has made it now when you got Ryan Reynolds dropping a, a Reanimator reference. <laughs> in life? Is, is the movie yeah. Lovecraftian in any way? Or is it just no, that drop? No, it's um, it's Lovecraftian, I suppose, in the way that uh, that Alien would be, in that you're trapped aboard with something. It's on the edges of Lovecraft, yeah. 
yeah, there's something other there. Uh, the creature design is pretty cool. Um, but really, for me, I just love seeing, I mean, this is an all-star cast, Ryan Reynolds and Jake Gyllenhaal. And when you've got those guys making horror films, that's just really, really good for the industry. You know, when all of these movies, the forerunner of Alien, and uh, this movie is uh, It the Terror from Beyond Space from the 1950s. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is a pretty good horror movie. But, you know, everybody talks about how, how breakthrough Alien is, and I really don't see it. Because to me, Alien is just a bunch of guys in a carriage who see a light in the tower of a deserted castle and go to investigate and get attacked by a demon. Yeah. Yeah, in space. In space. Yeah. Okay. This it's it's just, yeah. yeah. You know the It's it's a different package it's different packaging, yeah. you're right. Well, and very well done and written and directed. You know, yeah. every every story by now has been done in some iteration. So you're not gonna get yeah. a totally original plot. Look, there's only three stories. A man, a stranger comes to town. Someone goes on a trip, and Godzilla versus Mecha Shark. <laughs> oh, you forgot about Boy Meets Girl, damn it! <laughs> boy, right. boy Meets Girl finds out girls are vampires, or girl, right. girl, girl, girl boy kills boy. Finds out boy's a serial killer or a werewolf. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for Kelly. Mm -hmm. One movie. There, there's a few movies that. I didn't put on my list. If I had kept going, like Skeleton Key, I love. But one movie I definitely would have, if I didn't stop where I stopped, is Wolfen. And behind Kelly on the wall is that poster. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I like that movie too. I do not like the movie. Um, the oh. book is my favorite Whitley Schreiber book. I think it's amazing. Yeah, I, ne I, I, I never movie. read the book. I always meant after seeing the film, I always meant to get around to the book, and I just never seemed to. I haven't. I haven't read the book either. So I, I met him once at uh, a UFO convention back when I did that twenty years ago. Was he nutty? He's nutty as a fruitcake, man. <laughs> so I, I, I bought Whitley Schreiber's house in San Antonio. What? We moved from Pittsburgh. We ended up buying a house that Whitley Stryber lived in. It. He, he was selling it so he could have money to move to California. Nice house, but for they, they, they had converted the backyard mostly into a parking lot. And, and f for about a year or so afterwards, we would have people stopping by wanting to know where the UFO headquarters was. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kelly... Yeah. The Wolfen is actually one of my favorite books. Yeah, it's and so amazing. It is included. He's in, a good writer. It is, it is in the bookshelf of things that are Lovecraftian that are not Lovecraftian. I, I see where you're going with this. I think that's a stretch. I, mean, well, I see you, where you're If going you with called it. them ghouls instead of Wolfen, it's, it's, and they're, they're Lovecraft's ghouls, right? right. They're canine and, yeah. So, Lovecraft. you know, it's sort of like it's on that shelf that's like, yeah, with a push and a little bit of, of, of rewrite, that could be a Lovecraftian story. Yeah, I, I suppose so. How, Joe, how, to, how, it, close, how close is the book to the movie? I mean, not, nowhere near. Nowhere near. <laughs> oh, okay. And Joe, you, you ask about that poster. I love the art design on that poster. The, the eye, if you look closely, it's clouds, and then there's an eye that is the moon, and then... The uh, the irises or the lines coming out from the pupil um, is actually a cityscape. I think it's just brilliant art direction. Oh, and, okay. And so I love the poster. Yeah, I, I, I can't. Yeah, yeah I, it's far enough away and blurry enough that I can't make that detail out. Um, I no, I just I, saw it there, and it's like I I I, I really like that movie, um, and. Uh, I, I haven't read a lot of his books, but the one book of his that I've read that I really liked is, is this one, Majestic. You know, if you read it as a fictional story, which maybe he doesn't think it is. <laughs> well, uh, he did write a Lovecraftian book. He did? Forbidden Zone. I've, I've not read that. Hmm. 
And you did write kind of a more traditional werewolf story too. I think that was just called Wolf. And I really enjoyed that book too. I, I think he's a phenomenal writer, but yeah, yeah I've I've listened, listened to him in a couple of interviews and I was like, whoa, this guy is. Really yeah, proving true. what you're saying is not big with him from everything, I, every time I've listened to him. And of course he did write The Hunger. Yeah. So, you know, he never, if he had written that, and the Wolfen, and never wrote anything again. He'd okay. still be a master. And I got a question right. for everybody before we bug out. Is there a film that you love the idea of, that you would love to see remade and done right? Mm, I'd have to think about that one. Okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a movie that I like, but I would like to see it redone with with money behind it. Dark Intruder, because that was a small TV movie. It was yeah. actually a TV pilot. I, I guess for me, the movie would be Cthulhu, but I want it redone as The Shadow Over Innsmouth with money behind it. Mm-hmm. But but you didn't like Dagon. Is that the one? I'm talking yeah. about well, well, Dagon. You're, you're thinking of Dagon. Well, Dagon, Cthulhu was also Shadow over its mouth. Right. right. Maybe I'm thinking of the one about they, you know the, the, the Dagon is the one set in Spain and that's Cthulhu. the one. I right. About, right. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Cthulhu I did too. is Cthulhu is the one with the girl from uh, Beverly Hills. Uh, Tori Spelling. Yeah. 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 Oh, Joe, I, I know what I knew which one I would do. Mimic. What? That's a great movie. No, but yes, but the story that it's based on is completely different. Oh, I didn't even know it was based on a story. Is, I, oh. is it Donald Walheim, uh, Rick, or Wandry? It, oh, I, I, I uh, Donald Walheim's the Ace book editor, and Wandry. Yeah, so I, I think it. I can't remember who wrote Mimic. I. I want to say it's Wandry or something, somebody like that. I but think it's probably Warheim because I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I follow Wandry. I'm not as familiar with, I'm more familiar with Warheim as an editor. Okay, so Kelly, the story of, of Mimic is about a guy who moves into an apartment complex in in winter, and he's all bundled up, and he pays his bills, and he has food delivered, and. You know, after after months, he finally stops. You know, interacting with people, <coughs> and they they break down the door because it starts to smell, and he's emerging from his cocoon. Oh, nice! And he jumps through the window and flies off, and all these things on the roofs try to catch him. They're all mm. other things that are mimicking things that are we take for granted well you'll have to private message me with uh with the actual title and it's called the Mimic. It, it's, yeah. it's a short story by Walheim. I just yeah it. there you go thank you for looking it up but yeah it's a yeah. really good story that sounds good and it's just you know they they took that and they made that movie um and yes it's a good movie but it's not that movie now now just for the Walheim correspondent was lovecraft yeah. All right. Next week, Jeffrey Thomas, he's going to talk about The Endless Fall, published by Lovecraft Easy and Press. Uh, getting a lot of favorable reviews, so that's, that's great. Uh, Jeff's a great writer. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't bought that book, buy it. The Endless Fall and Other Weird Fictions. Available on Amazon. It's available in print and for Kindle. If you buy the print, you can get the Kindle version uh, cheaper. If you like having a Kindle extra copy, and then uh, if you want one of the prizes today, the prizes was a ticket to Necronomicon. And let me say this about the ticket to Necronomicon: um, don't put your hand up for the ticket to Necronomicon unless you're sure that you can go, because if you win the ticket, I don't want to take it from somebody else if you say, "Well, I can't go," all of a sudden. So, uh, and, another, and then what's your prize, Matt? It's, uh, it's this giant. Book the Lonely Shadows, 
the Lonely so Shadows. If you are playing the Necronomicon, it's a nice consolation. Yeah, there you go. You can read a book. And that prize, is, Fungal Stain, is for the um, Patreon. Yes. We'll give that out this week, too. Thanks, Pete. All right. And Matt. All right, so Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com. Put the name of the book or prize, Necronomicon, in the subject and whatever you want in the body of the email. And we will see everybody next week with Jeffrey Thomas. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.